Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's stand and let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for being our God, for loving us the way you do. And thank you all for all the wonderful things you've done this week, Father, in our lives, Lord God. Thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, that this would be your day, your time, Lord God. And we pray that we would rest, Father, in you this morning, that we would hear what you would want us to know, understand what you want us to understand, Lord God. You would guide us into your presence, Lord God. Pray for your anointing upon the worship team, Lord God. You would anoint him, Father, with a double anointing, that they'd be used in a mighty way this morning, God, for us, Lord God, your people, Lord. But Lord, also that they would acknowledge you as who you are, Lord, and your greatness and your power and your might, Lord God. We turn towards you this morning, Lord, with our hearts and our minds and lives, Lord God. And we look to you. Bless your people, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Good morning, church. Are you ready to sing the high praises of our holy God? Yes? Yes. <laughs> come thou fount of every blessing, or come thou fountain. We're inviting the Lord this morning to come and tune our hearts to praise him. Amen? Go 
courts above. If that's your prayer this morning, the Lord wants to answer it. Thank you, Father. Take a minute or two and say hi to someone. We'll be right back.
Father, there's nothing like being with the living God. Can't imagine what it's going to be like, Lord, when we see you face to face, heart to heart, Lord God. And we believe it won't be too long, Lord God. And we await that time, Lord God. But for to, Father, but for now, we have to settle for this time of praise, Lord, this time of your presence, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for softening us to you, Lord God. Thank you for melting our hearts, Lord God, in your presence, Lord. And Father, I know that today you want to do a work within us, Lord God. So, Lord, we open our hearts to you, Lord, this morning. Have your way in us, Lord. And we need instruction, God. We need teaching. We need understanding and knowledge and wisdom, God. So give us that through the word of God this morning, Lord God, as we look to you. Bless your people, Lord God. May there not be one heart unchanged by you, Lord God, by your truth, or set free. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Today we are in the book of Psalms, chapter 1. I know that we are in the book of John. We'll return to that next week, chapter 17, but since it's a new year, we decided that we want to kind of do a little bit of different study. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms chapter 1. How many of you know this psalm by heart? Raise your hand. Don't know it by heart, Okay. How many memorize it? It's a good psalm to memorize. It's really short. It's only six verses. <clears throat> this is what it says. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall, shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away, Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, <clears throat> nor sinner in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. Now, I want to read a couple of scriptures to you before we go into God's word. Proverbs 8.32 says, Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. And then Proverbs 1.33 says, But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Today, I believe we live in a very insecure and evil world. I don't know if you've noticed it. And the way to be secure and without fear and to have a blessed life is to listen and to learn God's word and apply the word of God to our lives. Today in our text, it speaks about being blessed and speaks about being happy. There are many Christians today who are not blessed by God in the way that God desires to bless every single Christian. And this is why I've chosen this today. Since we are starting a brand new year, every true shepherd of God desires this for God's sheep. This can be a more blessed year for you than last year for all of us. 
Now, <clears throat> this doesn't mean that we have no trials, or it seems like we go through trial after trial sometimes in our lives, doesn't it? Or even heartaches. It means that we will go through them with a different heart. This can be a blessed year for you as a Christian. And it's God's desire and heart for you that you will learn today or be reminded of where blessedness comes from and how it's received for us as Christians. Two weeks ago when my wife and I we were going on vacation, I felt like this is what God wanted me to bring forth on the first service of the year. So all, for all two weeks at night when I would lay down, these scriptures would pop into my mind and run, be run over and over and over. And God would show me different things. And sometimes I would write them down and other times I would just let them soak in. So I have been looking forward to this for two weeks. So I know God wants to do something within you, so let God do something within you. Let's look at verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of a sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I want to remind you of two things. First of all, the writer of this scripture is the Holy Spirit. Without a doubt, God's Holy Spirit is the one that leads every single man who writes the scripture. It is God's Spirit that inspires him, and every word of God is from God, and God breathed, number one. Number two, it is written by a man named David. <clears throat> if you read Psalms, and I was reading Psalms the other day, I was looking at all the Psalms that David wrote, and what was his circumstance. And almost every psalm that David was, had written, and he wrote most of the psalms, he was having a real hard time with life. Life was hard, it was not easy. Let me give you an example. One of those examples is Saul, uh, I'm sorry, Absalom. Absalom, his son, was chasing him. And probably six or seven out of the psalms he writes and he's saying, my enemies are great. And he's talking about his son, Absalom, and those who used to be in his court coming after him and after his life. So David is the writer, and he says this, through experience, that blessed is this man. Blessed translates in the Hebrew, the word is Esther, which has the idea of happiness or contentment. Esher comes from the Hebrew word, Ashar, which is its root means to be straight or to be right. Blessed is the man speaks of happiness, the blessedness, the contentment of life, of the man or the woman who is right or straight with God. The righteous man will be blessed and will be a happy man. This word also means fortunate and blissful. Here it speaks of more than a surface emotion. It is describing the divine bestowed well-being that belongs only to the faithful. This demonstrates that the way to heavenly blessedness is opposite to the worldly path normally followed in pursuit of happiness. The world idea is that happiness is found in riches, merriment, abundance, leisure, and such things, the real truth, is the very opposite. Now, <clears throat> when you watch TV, have you noticed what they appeal to? Well, first of all, they're going to appeal to your pride. I don't care who you are in this room. They're, when you watch TV, they're going to appeal to your pride. But they will also try to make you believe that in order to be happy, you have to buy their product. We watch television sometimes, and one of the things that we see in advertisement is Vikings boat trips. 
where they take you all over the Europe on a river, and it looks awesome. It shows you all the places where they can stop and where they stop and where you eat all the wonderful restaurants and they take you up into the hills and the beautiful places and all the old places in England, all those places. And they more or less say, you can't live without this. You need to go on that. It will make you happy and make your life full for the rest of your life. You'll have memories. There's nothing wrong with the boat trip. There's nothing wrong with memories. But those things only last for a short period of time. And they only minister to the exterior, not the interior. So, <clears throat> I've asked myself the question, are most people happy and content? Reports, according to the experts, believe that less than 20% of America and it's decreasing are happy. And so when I read a worldly percentage or findings, I always try to bring it to the church, to the body of Christ, because I believe that it should be 100% different. So I ask myself this question, <clears throat> how content are Christians? How happy are Christians? So I have to ask you this same question as a Christian. Are you content? Are you happy? Is that where your life is? And if not, why not? What is it that would, or you think would make you content or happy. If I were able to grant you anything, what would it be? Or maybe it would be a place you have never been. You, you could only go there. It would make you complete, you believe. Or maybe it would be a new job. Or maybe it would be to be healed. Or maybe a new wife our husband, or a new car. But let me share this with you. These can, things can only give you temporary happiness and contentment on the outside. But it will not last. They're only a short fix. If you have experience in life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> One of the reasons I came to Christ at 27 or 26 years old was I had a wonderful wife, the wife that I have right now. I had one son at that time. No, I didn't. I had two sons. And life was good on the outside, but there was something missing inside. There was a loss of contentment. I wasn't content inside. I was still searching. And of course, Christ showed on the scene and represented himself. I accepted Christ and my whole life changed. I became content inside. Life had meaning and purpose, and it still does. But what can happen to us as Christians is we can leave the things of the Spirit of God and walk away from those things or think we don't need them the way that we used to and we'll begin to walk in the flesh and seek to find the answers to the flesh and fill the flesh, which never can be filled. And we come to the same place as the world comes to. And I've seen it happen many times. A fascinating study on the principles of the Golden Rule was conducted by Bernard Rimler, the director of Institute for Child Behavior Research. Rimler found that the happiest people are those who, what would you think? Help others. Each person involved in the study was asked 
to list 10 people he knew best and to label them as happy or not happy. Then they were to go through the list again and label each other or each one selfish or unselfish. Using the following definition of selfishness, a stable tendency to devote one's time and resources to one's own interests and welfare, an unwillingness to con inconvenience oneself for others. In categorizing the results, Remlin found that all of the people labeled happy were also unselfish. He wrote that those whose activities are devoted to bringing themselves happiness are far less likely to be happy than those whose efforts are devoted to making others happy. Rimlin concluded, do unto others as you would have them do to you. So what do you think about this story, beloved? <clears throat> I know a lot of times I tell, tell stories or I share stories, or, but this story has something that we need to really think about in the sense of our own personal lives. Is it contrary to what you believe of how blessed our blessedness comes to you? You see, in our nature, and God, this is why God says to die to our nature, the old nature, in our nature we are very self-centered. We are very selfish. It's in every single one of you, and it's in me. And the nature of the Spirit of God is totally the opposite. It is to serve and love others. Do you notice what the two of the commandments that God gave us? It has nothing to do with us at all. It has to do with loving God with all your heart, soul, your mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. The only thing it says about self is as yourself. In other words, you love yourself so much Love your neighbor like you love you. Think about them in the way you th that you think about yourself all the time. And this is part of the which will bring blessedness and happiness for your life as you serve and love others. If you believe different than this, beloved, <clears throat> and please listen, if you believe different than this, you need to change your belief to what God believes. That's how it works. Whenever I read the scripture, whenever God teaches me anything, I have the option of saying, yes, I know that. Or I have the option to say, you know what, God, you're right. My thinking and my way is contrary to yours, God. And I need to change my thinking and my thoughts on that. Yours are right, mine are wrong. I believe, the same subject, that the devil is using the coronavirus to make people selfish and self-centered. I'm not saying it's not real, and I'm not saying it's not a sickness. It's there. But it separates people. And it makes us fix on ourselves and fears people, fills people with fear. So how can I love my neighbor as myself if I'm so engulfed at a stay home position, making sure everything's okay with me, making sure that I don't catch nothing and I'm not saying you, you, not to be wise. Please don't misunderstand me. But I believe that the coronavirus has been used by the devil in so many ways, but one of them is being selfish and self-centered, which is opposite of godly. Now, he goes on in this scripture And he speaks about how to be happy. Walk godly. He says, blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
The blessed man does not do certain things. There are three things he does not do. First of all, he will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of the sinner, nor will he sit in the seat of the scornful. So let's look at these three. Does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, he doesn't live by what ungodly men or ungodly women speak to him or tell him or want him to believe and accept. So what is his counsel? This word literally means the advice or the opinion of. To offer advice or recommend, to notify, to inform, to discuss something, to get advice, to consult. Advice means simply to recommend a course of action and imply that the giver of the advice has knowledge or experience. Counsel implies serious deliberation of weighty matters. So where does ungodly counsel come from or where can it come from? It can come from anyone. It can come from people who love you and people who are jealous of you. It can come from the TV, the radio. It can come from the educated or the uneducated. The counsel of the godly can even come from one's own self. Our own conscience, our own mind, our own heart can give us ungodly counsel. I've heard it said, follow your heart. It won't lead you astray. I was sorrowed by it because the heart is deceptive and wicked and who can know it? That is why it's so important that we know what God says. God's word is always the best counselor and godly counselors will always bring the truth of God's word to help someone who wants counsel. We have access to counsel more than ever in the history of mankind today. And you know what I'm talking about. I've seen some of you put in a word, counsel, into your phone. And it gives you information about exactly what the word counsel means. And it'll give you other things that you can go to and it'll give you counsel. If you say counsel for my marriage, there'll be a book that will be brought up and it's written by a couple that have been married five times each. And they have counsel for you concerning marriage. So we've been experienced, so look how much experience we have. We have all the answers for you. If that's true, why are you on your fifth marriage each? Well, love, we are apt to take counsel from people who might not even mean well. and are not wise in the things of God. Don't receive counsel because it sounds good or makes you feel good or even if it agrees with what you think. Be careful of counsel that agrees with what you think. Sometimes God's counsel hits you right between the eyes and it's painful but it will produce good fruit and lasting fruit. Question. How many have ever received counsel and acted on it and wished you had not received that counsel? I think we all have, haven't we? Just a side note. Be careful of the counsel you give out to others. For it can affect their life for the rest of their lives. Make sure it's God's counsel. Every one of you in this room have had somebody come to them and say, what do you think about this? What is your thoughts? You know, if I have a 
In fact, I had something going on with my arm and I had wingworms. I didn't even know that was existing anymore. I had these little circles around my arms. So I didn't go to somebody who's a mechanic and say, hey, what do you think? Who I went to was I went to a nurse and I said, hey, what is this? He said, that looks like wingworms. I said, what do I do for it? He said, take the mechanic's oil and pour it on it. No, he said. <laughs> he told me the medicine, what to get on it, and I put the medicine on, the wingworms are almost all gone. See, I go to a person who knows what they're talking about, who knows those things. And there are many people who are very equipped to be able to give you counsel in different fields. But when it comes to God, you make sure you go to the Bible, that you go to the Word of God. And let me say this. The Bible, I believe, has every answer for life and for godliness, because God says it does. If I'm having problems with my marriage, which I am not, then I need to go to the Bible and ask God what he says about marriage on my part. And I've found it to be true that when I go to the Bible, it doesn't talk about my wife. It talks about me being the man that God wants me to be. I've never went to the Bible and said, I got something I want to tell you. God just talked to me about you, honey. We're having problems with our marriage. You need to change. But let me tell you what God does do. He says this. Here's your problem, and it's not your wife. It's your relationship with me in this area. I can't tell you how many times I went to God concerning that, that he said, a dead man doesn't act like that. A dead man doesn't say that. A dead man doesn't have that kind of attitude. Oh, yeah, God, I just remembered. I'm supposed to be a dead man. Oh. You guys probably like that part when I say those kind of things, don't you? <laughs> now. <clears throat> so it says here, do not take the counsel of the ungodly. This word ungodly means those who are unsettled, aim at no certain end, and walk by no certain rule, but are at the command of every lust and at the beck of every temptation. Really, the, the world of the ungodly, today it is easy to see who they are. They are rebellious, they are lawless, and it's not hard to describe them. But what we have to do is be careful that we do not keep company with the ungodly because it's dangerous for us. Does that mean we never go around the ungodly? We never share the gospel? That's not what I'm talking about at all. We are to share the gospel with the ungodly. How are they going to get saved if they never hear the gospel from us? But the difference between a friend and an acquaintance, the difference between somebody that I listen to in their counsel and somebody who I'm trying to win to Christ, by example, and being light and salt. Number two, nor stand in the paths of sinners. Beloved, sinners have a path where they stand and the righteous man knows he does not belong on that path. Path speaks of a way, a road, or a direction, and the righteous man is not traveling in the same direction as sinners. When you became a Christian, when you accepted Christ, you entered a whole new path, a different path than all, everyone else in this world except for Christians. You entered in a different path a different life, a different manner of way of living. It's totally different. The ways that you used to live, the people you associated with, the things you did. Most of you, when you became Christians, drank, smoked, 
did all kinds of things that is contrary, messed around with things you shouldn't, well now you shouldn't mess around at all, and shouldn't be part of. We're on a whole different path. But if you are in that path right now, as a Christian, you need to get off that path and get on the path of God, for God has a path for you, and you know it. And you need to repent. Matthew Henry writes this with that same thought in mind. He avoids doing as they do. The way shall not be his way. He will not come into it, much less will he continue in it as a sinner does, who sets himself in a way that is not good. Psalms 34, 36, 4 says, he avoids as much as he may be, being where they are, that he may not imitate them. He will not associate with them, nor choose them to be his companions. He does not stand in their way to be picked up by them. Proverbs 7, 8 says, but keeps as far from them as from a place of a person infected with a plague for the fear of contagion. Contagion. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15 says, he that would be kept from harm must keep out of harm's way. Number three, nor he sits in the seat of the scornful. These people who are scornful defy all that is sacred, scoff at religion, and make a jest of sin. They scornful are these that set their mouths against the heavens. There is a great attack on the church today, beloved, by some people who are even call themselves Christians. They say such things as, there are too many hypocrites in the church and I don't need to be there, even though the word of God says different. The scornful love to sin and criticize the people of God and the things of God. The righteous man will not sit in that seat. He goes on in verse 2. But this is what the godly man, this is what the blessed man does. He delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and day and night. So he delights in God's word. I want you to stop for a moment and think about how much you enjoy the word of God, how much you love the word of God. This word delight literally means takes pleasure in, longing for, and desires for. David says, as a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. David had a, a heart for God in the sense of as a deer that is thirsty for water, longing for water. And this man, he delights in the same way concerning the word of God. It thrills him, it excites him, and it moves his heart. There is nothing else, beloved, that can change a man's heart or a woman's heart. There is nothing else that can but the Word of God. If a person delights in something, you don't have to beg them to do it or to like it. I say that with this thought in mind. If your heart has to be moved if you have to literally fight, I got to read that word. I don't care. I just got to read it. There's something wrong, beloved. They will do it all by themselves, someone who delights in the word of God. You can measure the delight by the word of God by how much you hunger for it. Have you lost your taste for the word of God? Start feeding yourself more and more Pray and ask God to give you more understanding and a love for the Word of God. You know, there is a saying, and it's about a potato chip, unfortunately. <laughs> you just can't eat one. Lay's potato chips. And when you start reading the Word of God, 
when you start getting into the Word of God, a desire gets to be stronger and stronger in you. And it's true, you can't eat just one scripture because you hunger for more and more and more. Now, it says here he meditates, not on his navel, but he meditates day and night on the Word of God, on the Bible, on the Holy Scripture. Let's talk about that word called meditate. The word literally means reflect upon, to study, to ponder, to plan or to intend, to think deeply and continuously, to reflect, muse, to run over and over in one's minds and his thoughts. Well, I can't tell you how important this is. If you're going to get the word into you, this is what you have to do. You have to meditate. And why? Because we need to have God's word in our hearts. Because when God's word is needed, it'll come forth. I believe whatever you think on the most, you will act on. If you continue to think on God's word, you will act on it, and your life will be blessed. Spurgeon wrote this, many lack because they only read and do not meditate on God's word. It is not only reading that does us good, but the soul inwardly feeding on it and digesting it. A preacher, preacher once told me, that he had read the Bible through 20 times on his knees and had never found the doctrine of election there. And that's very likely. It is the most uncomfortable position in which to read. If he had sat in an easy chair, he would may have been able to understand what God was saying concerning the doctrine of election. Now, Talking about meditating on the Word of God, this writer says this, as I looked out into the garden one day, I saw three things. First, I saw a butterfly. The butterfly was beautiful, and it would alight on a flower, and then it would flutter to another flower, and then to another, and only for a second or two, it would sit and it would move on. It was touched as many lovely blossoms as it could, but derived absolutely no benefit from it. Then I watched a little longer out of my window, and there came a botanist. And the botanist had a big notebook under his arm, and with a great big magnifying glass, the botanist would lean over a certain flower, and he would look for a long time, and then he would write notes in his notebook. He was there for hours writing notes, closed them, stuck them under his arm, tucked his magnifying glass in his pocket, and walked away. The third thing I noticed was a bee. Just a little bee. But the bee would light on a flower, and it would sink down deep into the flower, and it would extract all the nectar and pollen that it could carry. It went in empty every time, and it came out full. So question, you are one of these three when it comes to the Word of God. Are you a butterfly? I read, good enough. Are you a botanist? I took notes, and nothing wrong with taking notes, nothing wrong with reading. Or are you a bee? You get everything you can out of that nourishment. Now, in verse 3, he begins to speak about what the Word of God will do. He says in verse 3, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So we see a tree that is planted by a river, which will have growth 
and will have strong roots. Roots that when the winds of life come, and they will come, will still be standing after this storm because of the deep roots. We have seen many trees topple in storms because their roots were not deep or because their winds were too strong. God's promise, when applied the word of God to any situation in our lives, will make us strong roots that will cause us not to topple. I've seen many people's lives toppled by storm, beloved, that have come into their lives because of not having deep roots and not having the nourishment of the word of God. This new year is going to be a different than ever before, I believe. People have asked me this question, what do you think is going to happen this year? I don't know what's going to happen. Only God knows that. But I really believe that we're going to enter into a more difficult time in history because I believe that lawlessness is going to abound more and more and more. I believe that the one world government that we're headed toward is happening and being pushed. I believe that there are so many lies and so many deceptions and so many delusions that it's going to all increase. But these are things that we need to prepare for. We need to prepare for them spiritually by planting our roots deep. And that can only be done by applying the word of God into our lives. And we must know it to apply it. We must be taught and we must be learners and we must be ever growing. I have read the Bible over and over and over and over. I have studied the Bible. I continue to study the Bible every day. I need to grow more in the Word of God and in the nature of God, the character of God. You never come to a point of, you know what? I'm set in stone right now. The Bible says we are to live one day at a time. Why does it say that? Because you don't know what that day holds, but you know who holds that day, and you're going to need what God's going to give you each day and every day. We live in uncertain times in our world, but not uncertain times concerning our God. He knows everything that will happen this year in your life, and to me, that's comforting. But he expects us to prepare for it Building the house on the rock. Now, it says here, when a person bears this, does this, lives like a tree, applies the word of God, and the tree becomes strong and builds roots, that it brings forth fruit in season. As a fruit tree is to bring forth fruit every year, so shall we bring forth fruit in our lives in its season. If your life is fruitless, then start planting the word of God in your life. Apply, applicate the word of God, and you will bear fruit. We are all to bring forth fruit, and it's to be lasting fruit. Some people live on the fruit that they bore as a young Christian a year ago or two years ago or five years ago or ten years ago. Do you remember when we did this? Remember how God blessed us? Remember, God doesn't want us to live in yesterday's beloved. Yesterday I ate, I had dinner. My wife made some homemade soup. And guess what happened this morning? I got up and ate breakfast. <laughs> And when I get home today, I'm going to eat lunch. And tonight, when it comes around dinner time, my stomach's going to say, hey, let's try it again. Let's do it again. It's the same thing spiritually, beloved. Now, what is this fruit? Let me just touch on this a little bit. First of all, the fruit that it's supposed to bring forth is character. 
the changed life, the changed heart, you know, the character of Jesus Christ, number one. The second thing is supposed to bring is right conduct, the way we live, the Bible says in Colossians. The third thing is the witness concerning those fruit. And the fourth, we may bring forth fruit with our lips by praising God. And the fifth, we bear fruit when we give money to God and his service. But then it says, whose leaf shall not wither. This here is talking about there's always going to be sap in the branches. This tree will always have leaves or shade for its beauty. It will not be dead or withered like the sign or signs of death and dryness. And he says, whatever he does, no matter what it is in his life, it will prosper. This is a wonderful promise from God. If you apply the word of God in any area of your life, God promises you this. That in the area that you sow that seed, God will produce fruit in it. Think of an area in your life today that is kind of dead or drying or withered. And then say this to God, what scripture, God, do you want to give me today that I can plant in that place that will bear fruit? And God says it will profit it will be successful. In 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. This speaks of the prosperity of the physical and the spiritual. Now, listen to this psalm. I mean, Isaiah. Listen to Isaiah 55, 11 talking about the prosperity of the word of God in your heart and in your life. Listen to what God promises. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the things which I sent it. Now, a different translation, a New Living Translation says this. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. That's a promise from God. This will bring, as you plant the word of God in your hearts and in your lives, a solid life, a healthy life, and a beautiful life. That's what God wants. Verse four, but the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff with the winds drive. So what God is saying here is that those who live an ungodly life, live an ungodly way, literally, he says, they will be like the chaff. What exactly is chaff? The chaff is the shell or the husk of the wheat. When dried, it is blown away or is burned in the fire because it is useless. Chaff also means instability, useless, lacking substance. And as we look at the ungodly in the world today, that's exactly how they are. Spurgeon wrote about chaff, and he said this, intrinsically worthless, dead, unserviceable, without substance, easily carried away. This is a huge difference between a tree and chaff. And then in verse 5, he says, Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. This is not a politically correct to say, but it is 100% correct 
spiritually. God says that the ungodly shall perish. In other words, those who live ungodly lives will be condemned. That's what the Bible says. It's real simple. It's not hard. There is a separation of the godly and the ungodly. There is a separation of the sheep and the goats. And there's a lot of goats out there, beloved. This is a really a very simple teaching. This is not a hard teaching. Blessed are miserable, fruitful are famine, prosperous are empty, prepared are unprepared, prepared for what is coming. What must I do to be blessed, fruitful, and prosperous, and prepared? Is very simple also. I must be meditating on the Word of God. I must be continually eating the Word of God. I know you know what I'm talking about, and I know you understand. I can't tell you the importance of preparing for what's coming. I can just tell you how. What you do with it is up to you, totally up to you. If you think it's not important to learn the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to meditate on the Word of God, to live out the Word of God in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in raising of your children, if you think that's not important, you will. I promise you, you will. When the storms of life come, because they're going to come, or you can allow the storms to uproot you. Father, it's an amazing thing what you've given us concerning the Word of God. I don't doubt your Word in any way, Lord God. I don't question your word in any way, Lord God. I may question of what you mean, God, for I don't understand it completely, Lord. But I never question its truth, Lord God, its validity. I never question, God, that when you say, when we do certain things, Lord, that you will prosper, God, that you will make us a tree like a river by the rivers of water, as roots grow deep, Lord, that when the storms come, we're still standing, that we are healthy and strong, Lord God. So I'm asking, Father, for the, you to make the reality of the truth of the Word of God, the importance of the Word of God for each one of us, Lord God. And sometimes, Father, we will desire other things to fill that hunger, Lord God. We will cast away the word of God, Lord. So we ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that as you put a desire in our hearts for the word of God, to learn and to grow, to make us hungry, Lord God, that, Lord, we would feed that word of God more and more every day, Lord, that we would want to learn and grow in you, Lord God. Father, you say, blessed is the man. Happy is the man. Content is the man, God. If there's discontentment in our hearts this morning, God, show us, Lord, your truth concerning where that contentment comes from. It comes from that close relationship with you, Lord. It comes from knowing the word of God and its truth, Lord God. Father, make us godly counselors, Lord. Make us to know you and your truth and your ways, Lord God. And Father, may we grow and grow and grow, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen. Let us stand this morning. If you need prayer, we'll have pastors up here who would love to pray for you. If you want to come up to the altar this morning and pray and talk to God, please do. Before we're dismissed, let's sing a song together.
Pastor Dan has chosen a song for us to sing. We pray that God will bless you. It is our prayer that you will grow in the things of God more than ever before. And that the days will be that God brings that we'll be prepared because God has made us ready. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. Brother Dan.
bless you all as you leave. Have a great week in Him.